Hi everyone, welcome to a guest lecture about web typography, uh, one of the most exciting parts of web design I think, and the importance of which should never be underestimated. Okay, things I want to go through today are just an overview of typography and why it's important, and why I can talk through my own experience and how screens have really changed everything. And in terms of the World Wide Web, you know, where fonts became important and uh, you know, how licensing changed typography forever. Where are we now and where are we going? Uh, some of these questions probably will be something that you need to address. I want to include sort of the top 10 typography don't do's uh, and we can always learn from print design. And to finish off, just a couple of examples of some sites that I think push the envelope in typography. Before we start on the web, um, I just want to have a quick look at some historical aspects of how we got to where we are. The history of typography is long and deep, and it's really beyond the scope of this presentation because it needs a few hours to go through. Um, but it's important to understand why it's so important when we're designing websites that need to communicate effectively. Before the advent of movable type, the parchments and books were all hand-lettered and handwritten by skilled craftsmen, uh, which made them very expensive and really could only be afforded by the rich. The first example of movable type was in China uh, and was credited to China's invention of Bixing in 990 to 1051 AD. Uh, for Western culture, Johann Gutenberg, who died in 1468, developed the first printing press using movable type. Letters were cast out of metal and arranged together and pressed onto the paper using a printing press. The importance of this uh, invention was that it made books cheaper. Traditionally, handwritten and hand-lettered books were very expensive. What it did, it gave people access to information. It really enabled the spread of knowledge across all levels of society. So it's one of the most influential effects on human advancement. Okay, so how does my career fit into all this? I guess I've had uh, you know, 40 years experience both in print, web and now motion design. So I guess I'm speaking from the point of, you know, I've seen technology change my job, certainly. And, um, and, and the one thing I guess I can share is that, you know, really, if you think about it, typography is one of those things that can really transfer across mediums, uh, whether it be uh, in print, whether it be in web or any kind of digital viewing space that you choose, industrial design, gaming design, interior design, environmental design. So you're not really limited to where you can take these skills. This is where I started uh, as a printing a compositor apprentice in about 1981. What it did, it introduced me to a few things that I've kind of kept as part of my uh, collateral, I guess, is that you know, a lot of these things were very physical. Some of those things, some of those terms that have carried over from uh, the printing industry to what we do uh, as designers this are things like um, you know the term leading um, what that comes from the the way that I remember leading was actually having you know strips of lead that were six point thick 12 point thick and using that to space out text uh, and this is where the idea of leading comes from so in a CSS sense that's your line height so what you're doing is actually putting um, space between those lines of text uh, and there's a lot of other things that come from the printing industry that have carried through to the digital assets we work with now. Uh, you know, things like, um, you know, font family, font size, you know, and even the measurements in CSS, you can have M's, which is a printing term, uh, points, which is a printing term, and all these things that really do carry over from print design and, you know, publication design. I don't think people today realize how mathematical and detailed the whole construction of pages was, and still is, it's just done behind the scenes for you automatically. You would ring the typesetter, you would name your typeface, you would read the text over, and you would get it back. There was no WYSIWYG, you couldn't see what you were doing, it was just a bunch of codes. Sometimes it came back the way you envisioned it, and sometimes it didn't. The important thing is not to panic. Whatever you've lost, it's around here somewhere. Technology changed from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s. Hello, I am Macintosh. All of that old technology, just gone. Being able to directly manipulate type photography, color, that's what it's all about. That's the revolution. Okay, so we're finally getting on to, uh, to web fonts. 
Um, now I know that's been a bit of a long history lesson, but uh, I think it's important to uh, understand the context around, you know, showing text on screen because really that's where you know this whole push came from. Uh, traditionally, when when you did work on a on a Mac, you're limited to the font family and the point size that are installed in your system. So that means that there were two parts to the font. There was the outline part of the font and there was a screen version of the font. And what this meant was that you had to have both parts in order to see the, the font correctly on screen. Uh, an outline in PostScript, which was a vector, and then the screen version on the, uh, as a separate part of that file. There were two files in the system. The reason why that's important is because um, you were limited to the number of fonts that you had on your on your computer so I think there's about 10 fonts that you could design with and of course you know that wasn't really enough for people so a few things happened uh, around about 1998 I think uh, Matthew Carter was employed by Microsoft to develop a font that was specifically for reading on uh, on screens uh, it was but there were two fonts one was called Verdana and one was called Georgia and what they did, they changed the X height of the, of the font itself uh, to be able to be uh, resized to a smaller size, but still be legible. And even with these extra screen type fonts, there was still uh, a very limited set of fonts that could be used. In 1991, Apple introduced TrueType, which was a font technology that actually combined the outline font and the screen font into the same font file. There's another font format called Open Type Format or OTF. Now the difference between OTF and TTF, which is the true type version, is that the way that the outline fonts have been created are different. OTF and TTF use cubic beziers to create font outlines, uh, whereas PostScript fonts use a bezier curve. There is another one called a PostScript font, which is better for print work. There is a more recent format called WAF, or WAF2, and primarily the difference between that is that that's basically a, a wrapper around TTF and OTF but has a higher compression so that means that the font size is a lot smaller. The question now is how do we get these fonts into our websites? In 1998 CSS2 introduced the first uh, at font face rule and what they did that helped alleviate the problem of custom fonts. It allowed the designers to link to a font via URL, which could then be downloaded to the client's browser. But uh, th this idea of um, having fonts available to designers meant that all you needed was a URL, and pretty much you could just download any font you wanted without any repercussions to licensing. Obviously this created some concern amongst the browser developers because um, there was no way to license uh, what people were actually downloading to their machine. So the add font face uh, rule as part of CSS um, didn't really take off for another 10 years. During this 10 years um, what happened was that people were using uh, alternative ways of creating uh, design. So for example um, you know they'd use images for text, they would use flash, uh, embedded fonts, um, all kinds of ways of being able to display and use fonts that are a bit more in keeping with the design that's being intended. In 2009, a company called Typekit, which uh, Adobe now owns, um, allowed people to uh, link to a server that had licensed fonts. So by having a, a catalogue of licensed fonts, it enabled designers to be more creative with their work, so that the fonts they were using were legal and legitimate, integrate them into their designs, and uh, and really make a difference to the way that, that the web is presented. And this has brought us through to web fonts, which enable you to uh, go into Google or Typekit, um, download your font, or you can link to that font um, directly and have access to hundreds and hundreds of fonts that will allow you to really um, tune your design to suit your content and to suit your target audience. Uh, it really is a, uh, a new age of typography on the web and uh, it's very exciting to see where it'll end up. Okay, so I think that's enough about history. Um, the, the big question I think that you need to first ask yourselves for your projects is, you know, how do I choose the right font? Um, I mean, that's a bit of a loaded question because 
is there really a right font? It's only your interpretation of what you know you think the target audience will you know react to. Look for the most effective font that translate the purpose of the design. Create something that is memorable that people remember. You need a font that will make your uh, audience react to it. They need to have an emotional connection to that particular font. And because you've been given a target audience and an age, this will allow you to sort of develop a few ideas around that. Uh, certainly don't confine yourself to fonts that are, you know, geometric or that are classical looking because you feel that's an older typeface. You know, it could be something that's a little bit more, a little bit looser, a little bit more sketchy, something that actually has a bit of uh, life to it. The most critical thing in, in selecting any font is really to make sure that you're communicating. So make sure that it's legible, works at whatever size you choose. It really is important to consider the style of the text and make sure that it works uh, across, uh, you know, different sizes, you know, especially with mobile and desktop. Um, the other thing to consider too, which a lot of people don't necessarily think about, is the white space around the text. Always make sure that there's enough room for your text to breathe, um, have enough line height, have enough margin, have enough padding around it so that it doesn't feel like it's cramped or boxed in. One way of enhancing our design is to use font pairing. We select fonts that complement each other, so there could be a modern font and an older font, or it could be two modern fonts, two older fonts. But the idea is that you pick fonts that are complementary to each other. Certainly don't pick any more than two or three, because once you start getting too many fonts, it becomes a bit of a fruit salad. Uh, it's really important that your choices complement each other. Uh, I've put up a, uh, uh, an example of a site that shows you some font pairings, which is quite useful. Uh, it really does uh, help to make a site look a lot more modern. You know, you may have a serif for your body text, you may have a sans serif, or maybe the other way around. Uh, but just experiment and uh, just see which fonts uh, communicate the best to your target audience and make sure that, uh, you know, you just give them a go and be critical because I think some of these font pairings on this site, for example, are pretty lame. Um, don't use monospaced fonts. I'd encourage you to experiment and just to see what fonts work well together. But one of the critical things about typography is to control the, the hierarchy. So you have to make sure that your H1, H2, H3s uh, do have a visual hierarchy because communicating the importance of your text or the importance of your content is really what the HTML is there to do. And we can replicate that in terms of how we style things. Uh, it's quite important to consider the space between, between headings, between uh, with the line height, how big is your text, how much space do you put between those things. Now, there's all sorts of considerations with typography, so it's not only the, the size of the text, there's also the colour, uh, does it have enough contrast uh, for the background, where is it, how much space is around it. So these are the kinds of things that we need to consider. I'd certainly encourage you to do a bit of research about how other websites approach typography. Uh, I'm go I've got a few examples that I can show you a little bit later, but the main thing is that you actually start looking and start uh, digesting how a website actually uses space effectively, uses typography effectively, because the two are sort of inextricably linked, uh, because you can't have great typography without considering the space around that typography and around and in between the text as well. It's not just a one-dimensional thing of the actual font that you use, but it's how it's integrated into the page, uh, how it sits in with the other elements on the page, it's also about how you define the colour, the position, uh, the background. So a lot of these things sort of come into play in terms of how we want our type to reflect and communicate to our user. Now I'm going to just run through a few things about some um, gotchas, if you like, about good typography and not so good typography. Obviously I think that there's room for all typography, but some is better than the other. And some is intentionally, you know, meant to be bad, which is okay, because that could be a design aesthetic as well. So um, as long as it's communicating, it's all good. Okay, so we've got a basic site here, and this is just using the browser style. So we've got a couple of headings, 
um, you can tell a smaller heading, a larger heading here. As stands, um, that works pretty well, that's fine. Um, now let's just add some uh, CSS to it. So I've just got a couple of examples here. So I've got a basically a good style and a not so good style. And if I refresh that, so now you can see I've used a, a custom font for the uh, for the headline there. I've matched it up to uh, another sort of a sans serif font. Um, put in some style, and this is kind of um, you know fairly fairly easy to do, fairly self-explanatory. Now, if you look at the CSS, so if you look at the CSS, you'll notice that. Uh, we use the add font face rule here. Now that font is actually located on my computer, uh, which is a bit different to downloading it from Google. So you can see here on my desktop, or in my folder, um, it's actually got the, uh, the font face, which is a TTF file, which is a TTF file. And one thing to make note of is that you make sure that you actually look at the, uh, the licensing. The licensing is critical because it tells me that this is now actually open source software. That means that I can use these fonts without risking any kind of licensing issues. The critical things to is to actually uh, you make sure you download the correct fonts. Um, I'll just type in, so I'm searching for Montserrat, and you can see that we've got the, all the different weights that we need here. And what we'll do is we'll actually make it so that uh, when we download the fonts, we're downloading the actual font weight or the font style as well. Because what happens, the browser will actually fake that. They're called faux styles. It means it'll just add a, uh, a thickness to a bold or it'll just slant the text, but it's not the actual text itself. So you need to download the font that's appropriate to that particular style. So here you can see we've got two import rules. So one's got a wider range of fonts that are downloaded. Uh, so I'll just turn that one back on and, um, and we'll move on. I'll demonstrate the difference in a minute. I'm going to link the not so good style sheet to the, uh, to the site and then uh, we'll see what we get. Well the first thing you notice is that the, uh, the H1 tag is a bit, a bit skew with compared to the rest of the, uh, the headings. The visual hierarchy doesn't quite sit right in terms of um, the size of the text. Now you notice that the uh, the margins sort of close to that edge there, where the text is sitting right on there, does make it look a little bit uh, a little bit too close. It's always good to give your text lots of space um, because it really does make a big difference. But obviously, as you can see in the history there, uh, you know there's too much space at the top of that heading. Um, which is sort of detracts from being part of the same flowing document. Just have a look at your spacing. Um, the most important thing is to think about in terms of, you know, how much space does my type need uh, to be legible. Now, sometimes you need to add extra line height in order to make the text more legible, especially if you're using letter space text. Uh, you need to add a bit more line height to that to make it more legible. As you can see here that just putting a bit of line space between those extra lines in the intro there um, really does space it out and just makes it easy to read. Now one thing which I think um, in this particular example is that you know the, the actual line length is a bit long because uh, normally we have between 6 and 12 words normally we have between 6 and 12 words per line um, so that, that line length is a bit long um, the, the downside is that if you do that, it just makes it a bit harder to read. So try and keep your line length um, fairly consistent. So if we just make that a little bit less, uh, you find that it's much easier to, to go through and actually read that more effectively. Okay, so now you can see the difference in that we have, you know, a shorter line length, which makes it much easier to read. Just as a bit of a top 10. Um, Number one, you know, choose your fonts wisely. Make sure your fonts are appropriate to your audience. They're the first thing that attracts attention, so make sure that they fit to a task. And limit your fonts to two or three families. I wouldn't go any more than that, uh, simply because it becomes a bit too messy and too hard to control. Be careful with font hierarchy. Uh, use type to prioritize content. 
Use size, contrast, backgrounds and position to guide your reader through your content. Hierarchy allows for easy navigation of your content, so that means that you want to make sure that headings are correctly sized, things that you want people to focus on have correct emphasis, enable your, your user to really be able to navigate effectively. It's important to keep that vertical rhythm as well, so make sure that there's not too much space between elements. One key thing to remember is that line height really does help in readability. If you have letter spacing in your text, uh, give us an extra bit of line height. Also, if your fonts are quite large, reduce the line height because if it's set to 1.2, um, it'll actually be too much space because you need to reduce that down to less than one perhaps uh, simply because larger font sizes um, they take into account uh, an automatic setting if you like for the size of the letting I mean the line height so if you make it less um, it actually looks a lot better and make sure you keep your line length so the length of your your characters is about 9 to 15 words long um, that way you're not going to get in a situation where you've got these really long lines of text that are difficult to read. Font pairing is a good way to get some extra um, sort of design aesthetics into your site. Go to those sites that show you a couple of examples. Um, by all means, um, you know, have a look at the way that they've done things. But most of all, just experiment and see what works for your design and for your target audience. Always use white space effectively. Um, it really does help to bring your design to the next level. Uh, give text room to breathe uh, and really never underestimate how important it is because white space will actually make your, it'll bring your site design up into the next level. It really is an incredible way to uh, enhance your design. Make sure when you are specking out your type, you know, make sure you use font families. So font families are really a collection of fonts that have the same design. Font families are collections of fonts that have the same design but have uh, variations. So for example, you might have an italic, bold italic, extended, condensed, all those different aspects of that particular font, all contained in the same family. Think of your target audience, and this is where Persona can come in and help you to identify what they, their likes, dislikes are, uh, and what they might see as an appropriately, you know, aesthetically pleasing font. So uh, always good to think of your audience. One thing to remember is that a particular type style can set a certain mood. For example, if something has a fairly, you know, rough, uh, scripty looking, it, it could be a more informal kind of mood. If something's very sort of bold and upright, it could be a very corporate kind of mood. So establishing your typographic mood is based really on the, the type style that you've chosen. One of the critical things with, uh, with headings is really to make sure that your content is appropriate and really attracts attention. Um, I mean this is more of a discussion on content itself but um, in order to make somebody uh, interested in your content you need to attract some attention so you can do that visually and you can also do that through the, uh, the, the title or the name of the, uh, the, the heading itself. Just be aware of that because it can make a difference to the way users uh, interact with your site. Possibly the, the last tip is probably one of the most important ones because it really does help your uh, design and the aesthetics of your site uh, get to a new level. Make sure that you align your elements. So if you've got images, um, align them to the top or align them to the bottom or align them to the left or somewhere um, because as, as we read things, as, as humans, we like things to line up and we like patterns. So it's really important to make sure that your, your text and your typography fits into lining things up. Um, just like having effective spacing between uh, headings, also think of effective spacing between images and text, uh, between the margins and the text, and we really need to be able to um, keep things consistent. So that's one of the critical things is that if you've got a certain amount of space on one side, make sure the same is re reciprocated on the other um, if you want it to balance because uh, it's really important to make sure that we really pay attention to spacing, margins and how things line up. So I think that's about it for today. Um, web fonts is pretty exciting. Um, some of the new technology that is going, coming into web fonts 
Um, I didn't really even talk about um, you know, variable fonts that have all of the weights and everything built into one font um, and hinting and glyphs and all the other bits of uh, typography that are once again drawn from print but I think that uh, hopefully you've got a bit of an overview of you know where typography in terms of web has come from. Um, I think it's a good idea for, for people to actually look at print design because print has driven where we are typographically because it's been around for so long. Um, so I hope it was helpful, uh, if not helpful, just informative. The past few slides have been just work that influenced me over the years. Um, I particularly like David Carson, Neville Brody, and Eric Speckerman. But uh, one of my favourites, one of the new contemporary designers is Alex Trochu. He's just got the most amazing variety of work uh, in terms of typography. Uh, certainly one to watch out for, just love his work. Um, as you start developing a style, you'll understand how difficult it is to get a style that's different, but still a style. Anyway, uh, that's all for now. Thanks a lot. See ya.